Hi, my name's Vince from My Mate Vince, and in this video today, I think, I haven't opened that up yet, I think this is a Nintendo Entertainment System. So, there's a bit of a rattle coming from it. I bought it from eBay. I'll show you the listing in a minute. Obviously, it's faulty. And I think the listing said it didn't power on. Had to pay quite a lot for it, considering it is just a console only. But maybe prices are on the increase, I'm not too sure. Oh, I hate polystyrene, these balls get everywhere. Ah, oh, there we go. I'll be hoovering up that now for three hours while they just fly around the place. Here we go. Yeah, it's definitely rattling about. Right, here we have it. Now, I must say it is in very nice condition. We've got a little bit of grubbiness in here. But look at that, it's not yellowed at all. That looks... Amazing! I've, do you know what? That is uh, unbelievably nice condition. That looks brand new. Right, okay, let's get the power adapter. Something definitely doesn't sound good in there. And uh, plug it in and see what it's doing. Do you know what? I won't even bother connecting it to the TV just yet because it's suddenly listening, no power. So let's get the adapter, plug it in, and let's see whether this light lights up or not. Okay, so power supply, old NES. You can see the colour difference between them. So this one's working though. Right, red light on. Now let's plug that power adapter into here. Yay, red light not on. So it definitely is a fault. Excellent. Right, let's bring it over to the blue mat. I'll uh, show you what I paid for it and uh, take it apart, see if we can find out what's going on. So this is it here. It was originally up for 30 pound plus five pound postage. I put an offer in, I think. No, actually I watched it and then the seller gave an offer to me, I think for 10% less or a bit more. So I think I got it for 32 pound, including postage. Anyway, let me just show you the write-up. And it just says, unit only, faulty, no power. No power at all on this NES, plus the RF shield is missing inside. Hmm. Okay, well, I suppose RF shield, I'm not gonna be too bothered about because we're gonna be using AV, aren't we? So I'm not sure whether that would really make too much difference to the uh, AV signal. Polystyrene! Right, let's uh, take it apart and see what's going on, see what's rattling about. More polystyrene. Right, these are just normal crosshead screws. One, two, three, looks like we've got six of them. Let's give a shout out to the My Mate Vince Massive while we do this. This month the Massive members are kitdigital.com. Kip Hakes, Max Rokotelsky, Having Fun Repairs, Ellensburg Amplifier Repair and Service, Will Michaelis, Chris Seal, Felipe at MrKeebs.com, King Curd from Lobrook Auto Sales, DJ VG, Robert from Timsey's Auto Air, Albert at www.faroutsounds.co.uk, and last but not least, Stuart Park. So massive thanks to all you guys. And talking about massive thanks, look at this for the ultimate mug. This was sent over by uh, Dean from Puddle, well Dean and Rachel. I've never seen printing on a mug like that before. So it's a My Mate Vince mug, Puddle mug, just to say yeah, how nice is that? Thank you for being awesome. But Look at that, I didn't realize you could print on the inside of mugs. How is that done? Not that I know anything about printing, but uh, I really, really like that. I didn't know that was coming, and when I seen that in the post, I was like, wow, the inside of that. Even if you forget about the My Mate Maintenance thing, I think, would that not sell well? Just a nice thank you mug. You know, if you wanted to thank somebody, you wouldn't, have have, you wouldn't really have to have any branding on the outside, just that on the inside there with that. I think that would look, uh, I think that'd be quite a good seller. It's just so colourful. It's lovely, isn't it? Hmm. Right, that's all the screws out. Here we go. Right now, polystyrene! More polystyrene! God. 
So what is rattling about? A screw. One, two, three, four, five, six. Where's that screw from then? Oh, that must be for the uh, aluminium shield. Sorry, the RF shield. Right, okay, so power in here. So we need to get to this area here. So let's strip it down a little bit more because I can't really do any testing from that bit there. I need to get into this area. Actually, it could just be the power switch, but even that I can't get to at the moment. Right, these pull out nice and easy. There we go. Right, so it's got the bottom RF shield. Now we can test the power switch here in case it's all related to that. So which one is it? This one here. We need to pop this board out. Let's get our meter on continuity. Change the battery. Eagle-eyed viewers would have noticed that. Now, let's see. Okay, so this one's here, here is the ground, so I don't need to worry about that. So if I go across this one and this one and press the button, we can see that it is working. Now let's just do the reset button next to it. Yeah, so that's working fine. Uh, let's have a look at the solder. That all looks perfect, so I presume it's going to be getting to the end of the connector here. I suppose we could just see where the traces go to. So we've got this one here is going up on the red wire, and this one here is going up on the brown wire. So if we went between the red and brown here, red and brown, hopefully that will make a contact. There we go. Okay, so we definitely know that it's nothing to do with this part here. I know it was unlikely because it all looks so clean, but it's no harm in just uh, double checking that. Right, let's check out this board here. Do you know what? I'm going to get rid of these because they're annoying me. Bear with me. Okay. Ooh, big scratch marks here. Quite deep scratch marks here. What would have caused that? Maybe somebody was trying to pry off the uh, RF shield or something. Check it out. Well, that's a through hole component, isn't it? Going to these uh, resistors and diode here. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Right, okay. Well, that's not going to affect it there. Unless, of course. No, that's not going to be going to there anyway, is it? Let me just double check that. No. Yeah, I don't know what was going on there, but it hasn't gone through any of the traces, has it? So I don't think it's going to be that. We need to get into this bit here. Now, how am I going to get in here? Let's try to take this bottom lid off. Whoa! That's one way of doing it. Now, well, so we have the... Uh, the jack here. So we should be able to, it's a bit awkward, I think I'm going to have to unsolder this to, in order to take this top lid off. It's annoying that the power and the RF is all in the same board because this must be where the RF signal is going through these ones here. Anyway, let's put power back in and see if we can see any uh, trace of voltage at all on AC going through here.
Now why is that so low? Oh, here we go, 10 volts there. 10 volts there. Ten volts here. Five point four volts there. What about here? Five point four. The weird thing is, we've just got voltage everywhere. We've got five point four volts everywhere. I can always take apart the other one to compare readings because right now this is confusing me quite a lot. Right, because we've seen damage on the board. Let's see if there's damage anywhere else, just in case it's not, not nothing to do with you know the power side here. Ah, is that a crack? Is that a crack there? Ooh, ah ha ha, ha 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 ha, we've got a crack, we've got a crack there. Is that feeding that pin here, I wonder? Right, let's zoom out a bit. Would have still thought it would have given power though, unless this is the main one coming in. Maybe that's the main ground. Right, so, here. Go onto that pin. Should it be on that pin there? I think it should. You think because it's such a big trace there, you think part of it would be making a contact. Let's zoom right in. That must be feeding that one, mustn't it? Let's have a look here. That's feeding there. Yes. Right, okay, we found a fault. Whether it's default, I don't know, but we found a fault. So I scraped back the solder mask either side of the brake so that I can fill the brake with solder, but that might not be very strong because this part of the board might flex a bit because of the insertion of the games all the time. In which case, what I've done is I've scraped a bit of solder mask a little bit further back and I'm running the wire. This wire will allow a little bit of flexibility, so then if the bit that I soldered brakes on the actual brake, then the wire will do its job and keep the continuity flowing through that area. If it works, I can always add solder mask to uh, this area here later on. I don't want to wait for it to dry now. Let's just plug it in again, just to see if, uh, if it's making any difference. Here goes. No. No, okay. So it wouldn't have worked before with that, but that's not what the problem is. So now, what could it be? What could it be? Let's go across these ones here with voltage going in. Five point four fluctuating, yeah. So that must be that must be DC there then. Fourteen volts. Right. But where does that actually go to? Fourteen volts. So we've got fourteen volts coming up on the brown. Yes. What was it? Brown and red? What did I measure before? Brown and red? And we have nothing on the red because it's not turned on. But now when I turn it on here, we will now have 14 volts here, which we do. Oh, no, 11.8. That's a bit of a drop, isn't it, through that switch? So 14 volts there. And now look, it's gone to 11.8 now because something's drawing a bit of energy. It's climbing. So that will get to, uh, yeah, that will get to 14. Hmm. So now, is that just normal or have we got something bringing that down? Could be normal, couldn't it? Maybe this does run on, a, um, on 11 volts. Yeah, there you go, back to 14. Right, so here, nothing. 
turn it on. Let's see if I can just rest that there. 11. I'm just going to reset, see what happens. No, so the reset must be only for the game. Right, so we have got 11 volts going into the system. Ah, is that when it goes back through the voltage regulator? Yeah, look. So we've got 12 volts here now on the voltage regulator. So, God, it's a real roundabout way, isn't it? So now if I turn that off, look, we have nothing. Yeah, and now turn it on. Okay, so when we turn it off, we don't have anything there. Do we have anything here? No, so this must be the output, is it? Would this be the output? So now let's turn this on here. We now have 12 volts. Nothing here, is this the output? Yes, five volts, so this must be what it runs off. So now we've got five volts now working its way around, go into here, I think I've got this right, go into here. Yep, yeah. so we've definitely got five volts there. Have we got five volts going into the board? So we've got one, two, the third one along is where the five volts is, third one along from this side. So the third one along, so we should have five volts here, which we do. So now we need to work out where that goes to. Okay, so let's pull power. And let's see if we can get a continuity reading, see where that goes to. So we're on that one there. Okay, and it goes up to this one here. This one, the third pin, which is the orange one. Right, okay, so on the orange one, we should now have five volts. Plug it in again, volts DC. So it travels up these tracks here, and then we have now got, should have five volts on that orange one, which we do. So now, can we trace it from there? So tracing the orange wire, it goes off to the reset button. So the five volt rail there goes through the reset button, then through the LED and back to the main board again to feed the other components on the board. Now, there's no indication on here to show you that it's on because there's no red light. And I thought I'd better check the LED. Well, it turns out that the LED is blown. It wasn't me, it was blown beforehand. So now what I'm thinking in this stage of the video is that maybe this NES is working fine. Maybe me and the seller didn't bother to check it on a TV because the red LED wasn't lighting up. So what I do is connect it to a TV and because this is the NES with numerous faults as the title is titled, it still doesn't work. So I need to take apart my working NES to borrow the front board just to see if it then livens up, it still doesn't. That LED isn't actually critical for anything. It's just purely to let the user know whether the console is on or off. So, so far on this NES, we've had a break on the trace, which is definitely man-made, and we've got the LED completely blown. So there's no indication to say whether it's working or not. So what I'm now doing is I'm comparing voltages between the working board and the faulty board. There would be no way I could fault find this unless I had a working unit to take measurements from. So I'm going across that little connector where you have the 12 volts and also the 5 volts for the on and off and also the reset button to compare the readings between both of the boards, the good and bad. So the main difference that I can see is that on the faulty board, on the white wire, which is the top pin of that blue connector, we have 4.9 volts, yet on the working board we don't. So why have we got 4.9 volts on the faulty board, but not the good board? That's what I'm going to investigate. So, I think we need to look at this white one here, see where it goes to. So I'm confused why this is uh, reading voltage when the other one on the other board isn't. So what happens, it goes through this little capacitor here and it also travels up to what looks like that resistor there. There's nothing happening that side is there? I don't think this is going to be like a multi-layer board with, with traces in the middle of it. 
I think it would just be top and bottom. So through the resistor. Okay, then where does it go? If it goes through the board again, this is where it's going to get difficult. Okay, if I was to take a, a guess, I think it's that one there. And that goes into this chip here. That leg of that chip there. Oh yeah, so they've gone the other side of the board to jump over that one there. I think we'll get both boards out and let's measure the voltage on this chip here because that's the first part it goes to. Also, let me check on the other board because I'm wondering should this be going to ground or should this be separate? You know, would there, would there have been a little trace between here and here? Because obviously you can see that this is separate and you can see clearly that that's separate. Yeah, look, should be connected. Right, well, we'll solder that up and then uh, solder an iron on and see if that affects the voltage on that there. Okay, so now that's definitely shorting. Right, let's plug it in and see if it behaves any differently. So I've plugged it in. No, power light is still not on. You can see it's not lighting up there. And this is the good board here. Right, okay, so now let's see what's happening with the voltage on this chip here. Right, so we've got 4.9 volts that on that chip there, on that top right hand pin. Let's do the same on this one. And we haven't got any voltage there. Well, 0.3 for volt. Lights on. 0.3 for volt. Has that chip failed? We see what we have on the other legs of it. 3.5, sorry, 4. Point, ah, so we've got 4.9 there. Ah, so maybe we've got a short between there and there on R1, yeah? That's interesting. Let's see what else we got. 2.5. Well, I'm not going to be able to remember all of them. But I can remember those first two there. Yeah, so maybe that points towards this chip being faulty because look, we have nothing there but 4.9 there. Then when we're off, we should have nothing on both of them. Interesting, okay. We're on. Four point nine there, and nothing there. They're back to front. What is going on? And look, these should be all two point five, and they're not. What is going on? Let's look closely at the traces around there. Right, so they're definitely going through the board, but not these ones, but these two are going through the board. So they're gonna be up here. Ah, which is this chip. Not this one, this one here. Right, and then it goes to here. And 
And it goes over to here. One, two, three. And then it goes into this chip. Yeah, see that looks like it goes underneath this one here. This is the same as this chip, but it's got an A instead of a C. So would this be like the CPU or something? Let me look up what this chip is. Or do you know what? Maybe that goes right the way through down to here. Let's go on to continuity. And so we've gone from this pin here goes to here. This pin here goes to here. Now from here, ah, so it might bypass, it might go down to this one. Oh, oh, no. Ends up over there. What, so it goes through here and across? Hmm. There. Right. And I can't see where that goes. So this is where it starts. Let's compare those two chips and see are they the same. RP2A078. Right, they're exactly the same, aren't they? So, let's go on to the good board to begin with. And plug it in and turn it on. There we go, red light. So we should have 4.9 volts on that third pin here, which we do. 4.9 volts. Okay. Now I can't see it go anywhere else. So unless it diverts in the middle here that I can't see, it doesn't go anywhere else, does it? This is where it must start. So on that third pin, we have got 4.9 volts. Right. Let's turn that off and unplug. There's no way I could do this unless I had that other board. And turn it on. So on the third pin on here, we should have 4.9 volts, but we're not going to have 4.9 volts. Got 0.5 volts. So now, if it comes from there, there's no point in me taking that chip off. I think we should take off that chip. I'm glad I didn't take that off now because we're not getting the correct voltage on that pin to then pass through to here, is what I think. Let's see what that uh, chip is labelled up as. All right, this is interesting. Check this out. So this is an 8-bit microprocessor for the Nintendo Entertainment System. What I did is I typed in pin out. And I've gone on to this one here. Now watch this. This has the pin out for the chip. Yeah, now I wasn't sure which way it is, but I presume that V means this little notch here. Okay, now I wasn't, uh, just to make sure you can see pin 20 is ground. So if we put that on its side there, that should be the same as what you see on the board. Zoom out a little bit. And if I get my meter set to uh, continuity so it makes a beep, and if I go to a suitable ground and go on here, can you see it is coming up as ground? Yeah. So now we know that pin three here is the thing that's 4.9 volts on this one, but not on the other one. And look what pin three is, RST. And I thought, RST, hmm, could it be reset? And look here, if we go down, it says here, RST. When low, it holds the CPU in reset state during which all CPU pins except pin two are in high impedance state, which is pin two. Pin two, pin two, pin two is the one next to it. Okay. Uh, where have I gone? When released, CPU starts executing code. We know that the problem with this board is, is that it's constantly resetting itself. Hence the reason it's not working. Yes, I feel like I've made a little bit of progress here. How good is that? Thank God for Google. Now, let's get this one here. This one is the one with 4.9 volts. So when I hit reset, this should go to zero. Go on, look at that, fantastic. Sorry, I slipped off. So look, it's red light on, ah. Red light on, red light off, it goes to zero. So our board is being pulled low. 
which means zero. When low, it holds the CPU in a reset state, which is exactly what's happened. What a great website here. Look, wiki, nesdev.org. Fantastic. So plug this in here, turn it on. Now, go to here, pin three, and we are low, aren't we? What happens when I hit reset? Nothing, so it's constantly resetting itself. Why? Why is it constantly resetting itself? Is that a problem with the chip, or is that a problem with the circuit feeding the chip? I think I'm gonna to have to pull this chip out and see what we're measuring here. If it suddenly goes up to 4.9 volts, then, well it might not because you see all the other things are not connected, but if it was to go to 4.9 volts, we know the chip is pulling it low when it shouldn't be. But I'm hoping it's not the chip, I'm hoping it's something else in the circuit that's pulling it low. I think we need to get that chip out. Right, the desolder gun's just heating up, just thinking to myself, maybe something's pulling it low. Maybe it's not the chip that's pulling it low. Maybe it's a short to ground which is pulling it low. So I haven't got any power in it at the moment. We are just on, let's get an ohms reading. Pin, uh, let's do it from this way. Right, so that's 18,000 ohms, well 19,000 ohms, yeah there does it read the same here yes does it read the same here yes it does so now let's measure that against our working board 19,000 19,000 19,000 interesting so it is measuring the same ohms wise. I think it's the chip. I'm almost certain now it's the chip that's gone faulty. Let's get it out. Well, I must say that desoldering gun is an absolute godsend. I think it was probably the best 80 pound that I've ever spent. Because when it comes to stuff like this, I know it's more for older items, but when it comes to stuff like this, it's, uh, it's heartbreaking doing it with the solder sucker or with uh, wick, I think anyway. Right, okay, we're out. So now, let's turn off the uh, desolder thing for a minute. Let's see now if we have what we have on there. Because really we need 4.9 volts on that third pin, don't we? No. So it doesn't suggest that that is faulty then. I think it does. I think it does. Right, okay, I am going to take the chip off the good board and then uh, swap them over and see what happens because there's no point in fault finding any further. If this is the fault, there's nothing I can do about that that won't be able to be repaired. Unless, of course, I was to take a 4.9 volt line straight into here and just forget about the reset button. Is it such a big deal? All you have to do is turn it off, swap the cartridge over, and then turn it back on again, or turn it off and back on again. That's gonna be the same as resetting it. So there might be a workaround that we can do, but if that bit's faulty, maybe there's many other things on here that's faulty as well. Of course, that's if it is that. Let's get the other one off, swap them over, and put the good one on here, and this bad one, suspected bad one, into the other good board. Okay, so the chips have been changed over. It was all easy enough. So now this is the bad board with the good chip. Let's see what's gonna happen. So I'm turning it on now. No power there. We're not gonna have the red light anyway because it's blown. Let's see. I'm hoping that we don't have the voltage so then it's not this chip, it's gonna be something else. So third one along. No, that's fantastic. So something else is putting this down. Something on that pin there is putting it low. It should be 4.9 volts, but it's not. We know it travels round through the board and ends up here. So it could still be something on this chip that's pulling it low. That's correct, isn't it? So the only thing left that it can be is this chip. But should I cut a trace instead? 
if we cut it here and we have 4.9 volts here, we know then that we know this chip is okay anyway, but at least then we've visibly seen 4.9 volts. Really, we need to cut the trace here and here, don't we? And then when we join them up, we'll know by cutting it here and here, we will then... Uh... No, I'll tell you what I have to do. Let's cut it here to begin with. See if we've got 4.9 volts here. If we have, we know this chip is okay and there's something on this side that's not working. There you go, I've broken that trace there now, yeah? So now let's see if we have 4.9 volts here. Here goes. We do, we do, yeah. Right, so we've got 4.9 volts there. Now let's see what we've got here, this side. 0.5, so we haven't got it there. So we still haven't got it here. We've got it there, we haven't got it here. Still really confusing me how it's coming up there. But anyway, let's, uh, let's now cut the trace after that one there and then that will take this chip out of it. I know this is a bodgy way of doing it, it's just uh, be a nice, hopefully a quick way to uh, prove it. Okay, so it's broken there as well. So now let's go back to volts DC, plug in our jack again. Let's see what we got. So we should still have 4.9 volts here, which we do. We won't have anything here because this chip is now dead, as far as that line is concerned. Uh, what we've got here now? Excellent, 2.8, there you go, which is what it was on the other one. So now look, we're gonna have 2.8 here. Yeah, so we got the normal vo voltage is 12, 12, 5, nothing, and 2.8. So now, that's normal there, and we should have nothing there, which we have. So, it's this chip, which is a real shame, isn't it? Right, I'm on that uh, good site again, the wiki one, and if you have a look here, we're on this chip here now. And guess what the pin is? So we are talking about the second pin along from the bottom here. And have a look here. The second pin along from the bottom is reset again. So I've proved the fault 100% onto this PPU, this graphics chip. You would think anyway, wouldn't you? I was sure it was this chip. Otherwise, I wouldn't have replaced it. I replaced it with the one from the working board, so now 100% we've got a working graphics chip on the faulty board, and it is still not giving me the red light. This thing is such a head scratch, it's unbelievable. So we've changed over the CPU and the PPU, the graphics one, and we still do not have a red light when we're using the good board where the LED is working. We still have the wrong voltages. It's still been pulled low on that reset pin. This is really confusing for me. So I then look at the board further and I make this discovery that you're gonna see in this next part of the video. Right, okay, I've been tracing things. I found something that's interesting. To begin with, on, this is the working one here. And I do actually remember this from before. The leg was lifted from this chip here. This chip is labeled up CIC, and it's like a lockout chip. Can you see that leg's lifted from there? I believe that allows you to play games from other region. But if we go on to the 40 one, that leg hasn't been lifted, but that shouldn't stop it from working because originally it wouldn't have been lifted. That's kind of like a mod, a hack. But if you watch this, we know that we've got a problem on the voltage on these ones here, yeah? This one here goes to here, which then goes to here on the lockout chip. So it's going to that leg off the lockout chip. So that lockout chip is definitely doing something with this voltage. But now look, if I was to go on to the yellow one here, which we know is the pin reset on here, 
it also goes to the lockout chip. So it's possible that the lockout chip has gone faulty. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to swap the lockout chip out. And then, because that's also linked to these, yeah? And then if it doesn't work, maybe then it's something to do with the component tree. But I'm thinking now it could be something to do with the lockout chip. So let's, uh, let's swap them over and see what happens. Okay, so I've swapped those lockout chips over. So the one here now is the one from the faulty board, but yet everything else is the same as it uh, was before. So let's see now, hopefully this won't work. Plug it in here and turn on. No red light, okay. And it's pulled low. And we have 4.9 volts there. Okay, so that's behaving now with that lockout chip the same way as the faulty board. So, the faulty board should now be working. Plug it in, turn it on. No red light, but that LED is broken. So now we should have excellent 4.9 volts there and nothing there. Oh, nothing there because the LED is not working. That will only be 2.5 when the LED is working. So now this should be working. What do we have here? So it's a lockout chip, 4.9 there and 4.9 here. Yeah, right, let's plug this into the TV now and see if we have anything. Should I risk, yeah. Let's see if the red light comes on this one here now. So let's get rid of that one. So it's a lockout chip. I wonder, is there more faults with this one? Or is that it? Can you buy those lockout chips? So we should have the red light here now. Here we go. Come on, give me the red light. Yes, there we go. Red light, fantastic. Okay, let's leave this in here like so. Uh, I'll tell you what, no, out of curiosity, I do want to see if this one here works. So let's keep it all original. Let's bring it over to the TV and see if we have anything on it. Okay, here goes. Plug it in, turn it off at the moment. So this is with the faulty LED. Everything's now original, just a different lockout chip. Here we go. That's fine, that means it's picked it up, it's just that the game is not inserted properly because I haven't got this screwed in properly and also maybe uh, uh, it might need cleaning. Or maybe there's a problem with it, but let's have, a, let's have another look. So could I get the game to work? The answer was no. No wiggling or cleaning got it to work. So I went to bed with a tear in my eye. Right, so next day now, and I'm raring to go. Now, this is the good board here, but with the faulty chip. We know the lockout chip is faulty. So I've been looking into this lockout chip, the CIC chip, and basically what it is is, this is a lock, it's quite simple. This is a lock, and in the cartridge you have a key. And then when you plug in the cartridge, the key unlocks the lock. So this chip here, the lock, is communicating with the key in the cartridge. And then when they communicate with each other, it allows the game to be played. It's like an anti-piracy thing. It's kind of like uh, Nintendo. It means that only Nintendo games can be used. So they're keeping the quality of the games up rather than people flooding the market with a load of rubbish. And that might tarnish the name off Nintendo. So uh, apparently you can swap the lock and the key, they're interchangeable, apparently. So, I think, anyway. So if I unsoldered this from the game, this is one that I got from Mike. This was a faulty game. I did film it, but I never released it. It was basically faulty chips here. I'm not gonna release it because the video's boring. I couldn't get it to work. But the fault's on uh, one of these two chips here. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm hoping the lockout chip is okay. So I'm gonna take the lockout chip off this game here, and I'm gonna put it in 
to this one here. So I'm using the key instead of the lock, but they should, uh, they should still work. Now on this one here, we know that this lockout chip here is faulty. I did disconnect pin four just in case, because I know a lot of people are gonna say you should have disconnected pin four. I've disconnected pin four, we've still got the wrong voltages and nothing's still happening. So in other words, we've still got the uh, 4.9 volts here when we shouldn't have 4.9 volts there. We've got 4.9 volts on the wrong pin on this chip here because of this lockout chip. So I'm gonna swap them over and then if I can get this one working again, then you see I can take measurements against this one and find out maybe what is going wrong with it. I'm thinking it's a CPU issue now, but I don't really know. But I'd like to get this working because then it will make it easier to test between both of them. So I'm gonna pop this chip off here, put it in here and see if it comes to life. Right, CIC chip has now been changed from the one in the game into here. So let's see if the key can become the lock. So this is the good LED one, so this should light up red if it's gonna work. Wouldn't it be great if it did work? Come on now. Yes, yes, yes! Oh, it's blinking. That's fine, it's blinking, which is supposed to do when it's not recognizing the game. But remember, the, the pin four was pulled, and that's why it wasn't blinking, because then it doesn't make a difference. That, I believe, allows you to play games from other regions, but it means it won't blink. Right, let's see now if when we reset it, it's gonna, it's gone off. Excellent, that's fantastic. I'll tell you why that's fantastic, because at long last, <laughs> something's working, even though this one was working originally. No, it's good because it means now that I might be able to do some scope work or something, or I've got one of those logic pen, pins that I've never used, the ones that you see in Gadget UK's videos. Now, I don't think that they would work on really modern stuff like MacBooks, but I believe the communication in these kind of things are what they are built for, I think. Don't know, never use one. But what I might be able to do is, I might be able to get a game in here, and I, uh, hold on, would I be able to get a game in here? Yeah. I think I can put it the wrong way around, and I might be able to go across the CPU and the uh, GPU or PPU and uh, see if, for example, the signals are the same as this one. And that might give me a clue as to what chip is actually at fault here. Fantastic. So I get my Logic Pen set up that I've never used before. I think I got it for a very good price on eBay. I think it was like end of line stuff. It's from RS Components. I think it was only 10 pound. It looks like quite a nice one. Uh, I've never used it before, so I don't really know what I'm doing with it. But what I'm looking for is it measures high, low. So in other words, like five volts, zero volts. And I think when data is going down a trace as well. So all I'm doing is seeing the difference between the faulty board and the working board to see what I can uh, to see what I can find. Anyway, when I go across here, you can see high, low, and flashing. So I presume that's actually sending data. Low, low, and flashing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this on my working one and see the difference. I did find a pin up here which is not doing anything. If you look at that, that's not doing anything. That might be completely normal. But if that's doing something on the other one, that's great, because then I can start fault finding that pin. Do you know what I mean? It might give me an idea of what's what. I'm not sure if any of these pins, I think a lot of these pins just go up to this connector here, which are, uh, no, maybe not. Some of these, so from here, some of them go up to this connector. You can see there, look, hi. Yeah, I'm not actually sure what that connects is for. I've never looked into it. Okay, so I went across various things with the Logic Probe, and it is a very good tool. The problem is there's just too many differences. It'd be different if it was just like one pin or two pins that are different. Uh, they're different all over the place. But one thing that I focused in on is that on the faulty board, we don't have any activity on pins three and four up here. Yet on the working board, we do, as in these are completely dead. Now, when I tone them out, they go from here down to this RAM here. So if you have a listen, here, you're coming up here, and the one next to it is coming up there. Yep. Yeah. And then I presume from here, I presume they go straight to, one second now. I presume they go into, here we go, yeah.
there. Yeah, so that is then going through the board, through the via, into this connector here. So, do you know what I'm thinking now? Could it be that, we definitely know this is faulty here, the PPU, but could it also be the SRAM that's faulty? Because when I put this in the other one, it didn't work. So I'm really tempted to just give it one more go by swapping this and this, yeah? Because if you have a look, they're definitely able to take both lots. Can you see the smaller ones just have a load of pins here? So I presume these pins would lead to the same place. Yeah. So you see the boards are the same, they've just got different uh, SRAM chips on them. Right, while editing this video, I realised how confusing it must be as a viewer. The problem I've got is I must have done about six hours footage on the first day and about six hours footage on the second day. And obviously I need to make this video watchable and it's already a very, very long video. I know if it was three hours long, I it could then be make sense. It's just that a three hour long video, there's only gonna be a handful of you guys that would watch it. And I know you would enjoy it, it's just that I have to make the video commercially work. In other words, it has to be watchable than more than just a few hundred people. Uh, because of the amount of time sunk into it and this is my full-time job. So I'm just going to kind of recap about what's gone on here because even when I'm editing I'm thinking this is all over the place. So basically I swapped over the CPU. That is working fine in both boards. There's nothing wrong with the CPU. Unfortunately the PPU which is a graphics chip is definitely faulty. I've swapped it over more than once back and forth and it is not working. Now there is a chance that it's not working because it's married to the RAM chips. Unfortunately on these two boards the RAM chips are different. They're different manufacturers and they're different sizes but both boards allow the size of the small RAM chip and the big RAM chip. They have the same amount of pins it's just the depth of them is different. Sorry the height of them is different as in uh, when you're looking at them from above. So there is a chance that the PPU is married to the RAM because the PPU does have a different code on it across the board, so that is a possibility. But as far as I can gather, the PPU on the faulty board is faulty because it doesn't matter where I put that PPU, then it becomes faulty. But when we put the good PPU, the good graphics chip, onto the faulty board, it's still not working. It displays on screen a display, but the games are not working. It just has a white screen fault. So now the lockout chip, the CIC chip, is definitely faulty. There's no doubt about that whatsoever. But we've solved that by taking the one out of the Mission Impossible game. So that fault is now gone. We can forget about that one. So the problem we've got now is what is wrong with it? And as you can see on that bit of the video, that PPU does go down to the RAM and then the there's sorry, there's WRAM and there's VRAM. VRAM must mean video RAM. I'm not sure what WRAM means working RAM or something. So uh, it does go from the PPU through the video RAM into the cartridge slot. So now I've decided to swap the RAM over and that's what you're going to see in this next part of the video. So in the next part of the video you're going to see the faulty board with a good lockout chip. The CPU was always okay. We've got the good PPU in it, the graphics chip, and two of the definite working RAMs. And this is the result we get. Okay, faulty board. Different PPU, different CPU, different RAM, different RAM, different lockout chip. Come on now. Oh, if it was to work, I would be so relieved. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Wait till the TV turns on. Oh, come on now. Ready? Here we go. Hold on. Wait till it says no signal. There. Oh! <laughs> yes! Oh! <sighs> Thank God for that. Thank God for that. Please don't be. It was, the, it was the RAM. It was the RAM on the CPU. Now, does that mean the other RAM was faulty? Does it mean it was a mismatch? So on this one, 100% we had a faulty lockout chip, 100% we had a faulty PPU, and 100% we've got one bad RAM. 
I'm just wondering whether that other RAM is faulty or not. So thinking about it after the event, I don't think the VRAM, the video RAM was to blame because we definitely had a display. It was a white screen, but the game wasn't running. So I think it was the W RAM, which comes from the CPU, which was faulty. And that was stopping the game from running, even though it was displaying. So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to put all the good bits into the nice, clean case NES. And that way, then I can put all the horrible broken bits into the yellowed NES. So at least we will end up with one really nice looking NES. So to get the yellowed one working, I would need to put a new LED in. That's nice and easy. Really, I would need an RF shield, even though that's not going to make much difference. Uh, that would be easy to get. The problem I've got is I've had a look and I can't buy a PPU or one of these WRAMs. They don't seem to be for sale on eBay. I'm sure I can get a, another 40 NES for a lot cheaper, maybe just a board or something, and I can lift them from there. But at this moment in time, because the prices of NESs are still not that expensive, I'm thinking that most people just buy another one. Or they just, uh, yeah, they just maybe sell their old one as spares or repair and then buy a new one for £10 more or £20 more. So, uh, yeah, I can't get those chips at this moment in time. But what I've done is I've socketed the board which the, the the good board which is now the faulty board i've socketed the board there and uh, in the future then it will allow me easily to put in a new wram and also a ppu as well so uh, yeah next part of this video you will see it all nice and clean and one nes working perfectly at long last this video is over so i took all the good parts out of this one and put them into here now as far as this one's concerned it's looking really nice and everything is working fine First time, every time. So this is a game that I fixed before. If you have a look, you will see it will load up. Yeah. Every single game that I've tried, which is three, I think I have, are working. There we go. Right, let's get a controller in and end on a bit of Pro-Am. RC Pro-Am. If I come last in this, I'm out. what a nice way to end the video so there we have it I hope you got some enjoyment from it I found it really really challenging if I'm honest with you there's no way I would have been able to do it without the second one there but still yeah, that's the way it goes it could have been an easy fix but it certainly wasn't in this instance here and although I've got it working I've had to sacrifice one to make it work so I'm no better off it's just that I have one nice looking one compared to one not so nice looking uh, that is it I hope you enjoyed it if you did give it a thumbs up take care everyone